bringing new money and jobs to town. Confirming the identity of those two pilots to return to full capacity here at Lake Arrowhead, you'd have to take me, then stand myself on my shoulders two more times. To watch his tutorial video, click on the Six on Your Side story link on our website. Let's see how it tastes. They're expecting record crowds today, and it's no surprise after meeting the guest speaker. With the addition of Chick-fil-A, and then of course you have Dickie's Barbecue and Rib Crib um, at, at two different ends of that parking lot, uh, you're, you're going to have some uh, congestion within the parking. The Texas Department of Transportation released the latest saturation data report for the city of Wichita Falls back in 2010. The report counts the volume of traffic in a 24 hour period across major roadways in the falls. The numbers prove then and now city streets surrounding Wichita Square remain an issue. It's a very busy area, obviously, uh, and Obviously, since that 2010, there's been a lot of construction going on in that area, which is a good problem. We like to see construction, but it, it has uh, led to some traffic congestion. News Channel 6 filed a request with the Wichita Falls Police Department to learn just how many traffic accidents happen in and around the area. The past nine months since the railroad construction project wrapped up, nearly 50 accidents were reported. In hopes of avoiding all the mess, drivers are taking matters into their own hands. It's a shortcut for me. It saves me about 10 minutes, depending on if uh, Chick-fil-A is having lunch hour. And um, it just puts me closer to where I want to get. Most of the time, I'm heading back up Lawrence. The alleyway behind Coles is a direct shot linking two of the busiest roads in the falls. I took to the streets to get a closer look at the problem. During lunch hour this week, I posted up a camera with a straight view of the alley. In 60 minutes, I clocked 94 vehicles using the road. That's more than one vehicle a minute. However, the alleyway is not authorized for public access. This is the only sign we found notifying drivers they should not use the through street. I asked the owners of Dickie's Barbecue if they're the ones who put the sign up. They told me it wasn't them and it's been here since they have. Most drivers I talked to said they didn't even notice it was here. Did you know that or what? No, I had no idea. I've never seen the sign. How, what do I think about it? If I can't see it, I really can't respond to it. So if, maybe if it was bigger, if it was posted along the fence or lessen your tax burden, sell it to the town, and, and make it at access. This is just a convenience. This is why everybody's gone. It's obvious. It should tell the city something that we have an issue with the, our, our traffic right here, so people are trying to go this, the best route, and this is it. While some drivers are on the same page to find a fix, I found out it's not the city's responsibility. It's really up to the architect and the developer as to what kind of layout that they will have for traffic. Now, the city is responsible for traffic on streets and intersections and things like that, but once it gets into the property, then it's the developer and the architect that design it. As far as us going in there and saying, no, you're, you're going to put a stop sign here or whatever, we really do not have that authority because it is private property. It begs the question, if Wichita Falls and law enforcement have no control over traffic flow in the parking lot, where are the property owners and do they have plans to alleviate congestion concerns? That's when getting answers from the property owner became a journey in itself. City officials tell me the building is owned by KO Wichita Falls Portfolio LP. Even though the company is filed in Texas, I was directed to offices located everywhere from Delaware to even Canada to try and get in contact with executives. So I tried a different angle, reaching out to corporate contacts for the businesses leasing the property. One said they have nothing to do with the parking lot. The other was a dead end. You reach Jeffrey Poole. I'm on the road traveling. Leave your name and number after the tone. You may reach me by email, jeff.pool at coles.com. Returning Friday, August 9th. Thanks. City officials say although they can't do anything in the meantime, there are other options. They do have Maplewood as a reliever road that is right now being underutilized. Um, there's still a lot more capacity on Maplewood that would do the exact same thing that they're trying to do by cutting back behind those businesses. Brittany Glass, News Channel 6. News Channel 6 anchor Brittany Glass went behind the scenes with city leaders to learn how lake levels are taken and how we've arrived at this devastating point. 
It's all in this six on your side special report. I would say we're in deep, but I definitely think we're in the shallows as far as water goes. Pump mechanic Luke Baker is one of 10 men who measure levels each week at Lakes Arrowhead and Kickapoo. He's seen firsthand the drought's impact on the water supply. Between one time and the next, there's been times that I've seen a foot or more drop out of the lakes. Baker's worked for the water purification department for the city of Wichita Falls for nearly a decade. He walked me through the facility's intake centers where levels are measured, and I got a shot at measuring levels for myself. And we can calculate the percent of water that is left in the lake from those elevations. I compile those percentages into a report. They're distributed once a week to the uh, city manager, the council, the water resources committee and our public information office. News Channel 6 filed an open records request with Wichita Falls to learn just how quickly and drastically lake levels have dropped. Since January 2011, prior to Texoma's infamous summer of more than 100 straight days of triple digit heat, lake levels have been consistently on the decline. The trend continued the past three years and it may not be over anytime soon. These droughts, if you look at history, 30s, 50s, 80s, they typically last about 10 years. I'm not saying wow. that this one will last 10 years, but I don't like the way the weather patterns look. On average, 29 inches of rain falls each year in Wichita Falls. Not even half that actually fell in 2011. While things improved in 2012, this year we haven't even hit 16 inches of rain so far. Earlier in the uh, year, we did see some good rain, especially back in July over the watersheds, right. and that slowed down the progression of the stage four. I took a closer look at the lack of rainfall and its effects at both lakes. To put things into perspective, in order to return to full capacity here at Lake Arrowhead, you'd have to take me, then stand myself on my shoulders two more times. Residents here at Lake Kickapoo tell me they used to use this pier for normal things like fishing. They used to jump off of it and swim. Now they can literally access it with their ATVs instead. We suffered through last summer and it was bad. This summer's worse. Uh, but uh, Lord willing, we'll still be here next year. Lake residents want to know what can bring about a drought recovery. We need a disaster to happen to correct this drought. A disaster meaning a major flood event uh, over a wide area, especially down in the watersheds, to get us out of this drought. City officials remain optimistic when it comes to entering into stage four. If it cools off and that evaporation rate goes down and we start getting some rain, it could delay it on into the winter or possibly next year. We just have to wait and see what happens over the course of the next four weeks. For those who live on the shoreline, there's no time to waste. I think we should have been in stage four months ago, uh, but you know, that's not my call. At hindsight, it's 2020. When you don't have the water, you have no options. There's no plan B. It's a rough road at times. I mean, you gotta have the water and you gotta have the fishermen and we just hang with whatever you know, happens. Brittany Glass, News Channel 6. What do we want? Dream it! What do we want? Yeah! Some 130,000 illegal immigrants live in Utah. Voters choosing among candidates in state legislative races will be electing representatives who will confront the illegal immigration issue in January when the legislature convenes. Representative Steven Sandstrom plans to offer a bill targeting illegal immigrants. If we can solve the illegal immigration problem in this country, crack down on them, have them self-deport, get a secure border, then that can open the door for opportunities for people from all over the world to come here. Those who support Sandstrom's new immigration bill say Utah has no other option. Look at the amount of money that we're currently spend spending on emergency births of, illeg of illegal aliens, on food stamps, the other, uh, the other problems. How are, how are we going to pay for that? However, on the opposite side of the debate, people say that immigration is not a state's right and that trying to change it locally simply won't work. What the states are trying to do with this uh, patchwork quilt of different laws is going to be so confusing. Others say state immigration laws like Sandstrom's discriminate. As just one component of, you know, for human rights. Even so, Sandstrom justifies his bill. It really is an issue of pro-immigrant to crack down on illegal immigration. Sandstrom's opponent isn't focusing on immigration because he says Utahns believe there are more important issues at hand this election. Education, job creation, economy, and legislative ethics are, 
are the most key issues. That Despite the battle over Sandstrom seat in the Utah House and mixed views over what to do about immigration, Governor Gary Herbert is optimistic for a positive outcome. We'll find a Utah solution to this issue, and I expect that the legislature will come together. Brittany Glass, Election 2010.